So in chapter 7, what we're looking at here is um, qualitatively and quanti quantitatively how we engage in measurement. And again, just to review for us, the <coughs> when there is this need for measurement, it's much more than just distinguishing between quantitative and qualitative. Quantitative, again, being numbers, qualitative being words, descriptions, non-numeric ways of talking about things. Rather, there's three different ways of making this distinction. And the first one being timing. Um, when we're talking about things quantitatively, what we do is we think about the variables and we convert them into actions during the planning stage. And then we separate that from the gathering or the analyzing of data. So that's what we do quant in quantitative. There's a distinction or a timing difference between how we think about it in the planning stage versus what we do in the gathering and analyzing stage. In qualitative, though, what we're doing is that we're actually measuring during the data collection phase. So in the qualitative, you don't see that distinction in timing. You don't start to um, think about the categories until you're actually measuring things. When it comes to the types of data, in quantitative, what we're doing is that we're using the techniques that are going to produce data in the form of numbers. And the numbers themselves, what's um, liked about them is that they're uniform, they're standardized, they're quite compact. And the reason why quantitative is sometimes liked by some is exactly though that reason, is that it is compact, there's not a lot of controversy involved. In qualitative, the types of data, the observations obviously are not uniform, and that then creates the disorder, the confusion, and the tension. And then there is that linkage between the construct, um, the construction of the data and the data itself. And what we're doing here is we're talking about how do we connect the concepts to the data. And you see that distinction, at least, in the qualitative and the quantitative. Okay, so in the measurement process, when we're talking about conceptualization here, we're talking about a process. We're talking about the process of how um, we develop a clear, a rigorous, uh, systematic um, definition of an abstract idea. So, <coughs> so an example of that would be me saying something like talking about inequality. Well, that's such a broad topic. I would need to obviously talk about what form of um, inequality I'm talking about. I need to talk about how I would actually start to measure that kind of thing. And what that oftentimes leads to for conceptualization is to the oper operationalization. In the operationalization, what I'm doing is I'm moving from that conceptual definition that I have then to the thing that I can actually observe. So again, starting out with this concept of inequality, maybe I reduce it down to income inequality. Then, with income inequality, in the operationalization phase, I would, I would talk about what specific um, parts or components of income would I include as income um, for a family or for an individual. In the quantitative measurement, then, what we see here are um, rules of correspondence. We see conceptual hypotheses, and we see empirical hypotheses. <coughs> what you see here, and I'm using my um, computer cursor here, so hopefully you can watch it here, is that we started out with an abstract um, construct, inequality. Then I got down to conceptual definition income inequality. And then I actually had a thing that I was going to measure that income inequality with, right? I had some certain types of income that I was going to add up to equal this. Okay. Now, what I need to then do is I need to then look at, with this idea of inequality, what are the things that are going to affect that independent variable? That would be the dependent variables. <coughs> so, in the rules of correspondence, what I'm doing is I'm looking for the way in which I can connect 
the abstract constructs. And what I'm doing in that abstract construct with the rules of correspondence is I'm looking at the arrows. The arrows that go between the abstract construct for the independent variable to the abstract construct for the dependent variable. I need a connection between the two, a hypothetical causal relationship. The way that I describe using the literature that causal relationship existing, that is your rule of correspondence. Then I need a conceptual hypothesis. I need some type of hypothesis that's going to express all the variables that exist and the relationships that exist among them. So here, in my conceptual definition, I have to have some way now that I'm connecting this conceptual definition almost to this conceptual definition. So if I could add another arrow here, he would be my conceptual hypothesis. It's a <coughs> in some sense a restatement of my rules of correspondence except now it's applying to my conceptual definition and then finally I have my empirical hypothesis and we see that on the bottom right here in that empirical hypothesis what I'm doing is I'm expressing the variable in a specific empirical or quantitative term and here's then where we see the numbers right that <coughs> something along the lines of 3% more income to the upper class contributes to X amount percent less of inequality among a specific kind of household. So then when we get to the qualitative measurements, what I'm looking at here is the conceptualization, again, the operationalization, not any different than the quantitative measurement, except now at the last step we have casing. So for conceptualization for qualitative measurement, it's not too different here. What we're doing is that instead of refining abstract ideas into theoretical definitions early on in the process, and that's the key idea there, early on in the process, <coughs> What we do instead is we're taking working ideas that are quite crude and rudimentary and refining them. So conceptualization is in some sense the process then of taking a coherent theoretical definition and make sense of that and to organize all of your findings, all of the things that you collect as information. In the operationalization, what you're doing here is you're developing a description of how um, we're using the working ideas while making observations. So in the operationalization, what I'm doing is I'm telling you what the process is by which I'm taking in these qualitative um, concepts that are coming in and how I'm organizing them. And then casing is how I bring that all together, how I bring together the data with the theory. That's a pretty essential thing in what makes a good qualitative researcher, what distinguishes a good qualitative researcher from a bad one, or not as good one. Now, the central concern with quantitative research would be um, its reliability and its validity. So let's look first at the reliability from a measurement standpoint. Stability reliability is talking about its reliability over time. Um, is this a measure that can get you some consistent results at different time points? Um, our measurement of the mile um, is a pretty stable measurement. It's a stable measurement because a mile is a mile and um, how far a mile is was something that was established uh, if I'm not mistaken, like 150 years ago or something. But we know that at least since that point in time, a mile has had a consistent measurement. Then we have reli representative reliability. That means how reliable is this measurement across different groups? <clears throat> so if I'm trying to measure income across different groups in different countries, um, it might not be useful, for instance, to think that income earned from work would be a representative reliability. Uh, let me give you an example. <coughs> so if I'm measuring income in the United States, <coughs> some 90% of the economy is what we would call above ground or legal economy, meaning I work for my employer and... Um, 
they pay me a legitimate paycheck and it's very easy to track. Um, in the country of Mongolia, where I've done a lot of research, um, in Mongolia, it's the opposite. Only 10% of the economy is legal, um, above ground. The rest of it is underground, which would mean that if I'm measuring income and I'm looking at payroll data, it's going to give me a pretty representative number in the U.S., but it's not going to be that useful if I start looking at things um, and making comparisons to Mongolia because most of the workers don't work that kind of way. And then finally, we have the equivalence reliability. That would mean how reliable is the data across the different um, indicators. Now, how would you start to engage in improving reliability? Um, you could try to improve reliability by um, engaging in the conceptualization process such that you are um, incredibly clear, uh, clear and perhaps most importantly, that each measure is just covering one type of thing, right? So that I'm not using income to measure or to be a proxy variable or representative of a bunch of different things. Maybe it should just be my measure of income coming in rather than an indirect measure of happiness or unhappiness, an indirect measure of wealth. It can't be all those things, or if it is, it becomes less reliable. Then um, what we could do is we could also just increase the level of measurement. In other words, we could just have a more careful construct um, of that measurement indicator, right? Like a mile is useful, but if I'm measuring, um, you know, nanotechnology, even a millimeter would be too large then. So obviously, a mile as my unit of measurement wouldn't be reliable if I was in dealing with nanotechnology. <coughs> then we have in for the multiple indicators here is that we could use multiple indicators, but they should be of the same construct. If they're the same construct, that will increase my reliability. And then there's this whole idea of the pretest, the pilot studies, and the replication. That is basically, as I repeat something time after time after time, I will get better at it, and the, in these drafts, my process will improve. Okay, so when we think about the quantitative research, and we start to think about the validity, and when we talk about what measurement validity is, it's essentially the way in which... <coughs> We talk about how well an empirical indicator or a <coughs> quantitative indicator and that conceptual definition we have of the construct um, fit together. Like, how well does that measurement fit to the concept? So we have face validity. That would be the way where, um, essentially on face value, does that type of measurement validity, does it just make sense? Does it make sense from a um, practical street sense standpoint? Then we have the content validity. And in the content validity here, what we're doing is we're trying to measure, um, represent all the aspects of the conceptual definitions of the construct. In the criterion validity, what we're doing is relying on some of the independent and the outside verification. And what we do within that criterion validity is we're looking at the concurrent validity, which is um, where I'm looking at the pre-existing conditions and the already accepted measures to, <coughs> to in some sense, um, verify my indicators. And then we've also got the predictive validity. And in the predictive validity, what I'm doing is I'm looking at the future events or behaviors and making sure that that's logically consistent. <coughs> in the construct validity, what I'm doing is I'm looking at multiple indicators and I'm looking at at least two different um, subtypes. And in the convergent validity, um, you know, in the convergent validity, we're looking at how the different constructs, how they converge. Um, do they come together in a reliable sense, in a sense where um, 
I can start to see some unity um, among the different concepts. Now that's as opposed to my discriminant validity where my indicators actually start to diverge. Um, I would want to probably see um, at least, well depending on what you're trying to measure, um, you know, for instance, for income inequality and wealth inequality, I would want to see some convergent validity because the more there is income inequality, there should be more um, uh, wealth inequality. But I should see discriminant validity between wealth inequality and access to health care equality, right? That the more inequality there is in wealth, at least in the United States, should mean that you have different access to um, the health care that you need. And that's where you start to see this in these pictures here. Um, I'm not going to um, talk about them too much. They're straight from the book. Um, nothing too exciting here. Um, but if you're more of a, the reason why I include them is that if you are a visual learner, seeing this would be, um, you know, would be useful. In face validity, as you see here, um, the scientific community is kind of separated off, and it's more of does it just make sense? Um, the content validity, again, would be I have my construct. Does it make sense with the measures that I have? In the criterion validity here, you see the interesting relationship between my existing measure and how I think that will exist in the um, future. And what I'm trying to do with my criterion validity is get similar results. <coughs> and then in my construct validity, here we either see something like income and wealth inequality as my measurement in the white on the bottom here, and then income inequality or wealth inequality and access to health care, which would be much more of a divergent um, or discriminant um, validity. Okay, um, so if we look at what the relationship is between reliability and validity, well, it depends what your objective is. It depends what you're trying to measure. Um, I can't imagine a scenario where you would want both low reliability and low validity, but I could imagine some situations where you might really want reliability without as much concern about validity and vice versa. I could imagine some other situations where you want to have a lot of validity but not as much reliability. Although those kinds of examples would be fewer between. The, uh, you know, the, the holy grail, the most perfect situation would be to have both high reliability as well as high validity um, in your quantitative measurements. Okay, so what does reliability mean then? It means it's dependable data. It means it's trustworthy data. Validity then is broken down into three parts, internal, external, and statistical. The internal, the inter internal validity would mean that I have no errors that are internal to the design of my research project, that my research project was designed to not have these kinds of errors. In the external validity here, I'm using that primarily in experimental research, and I'm trying to see is, you know, can we see the things that are giving me that validity? In statistical validity, what I'm looking at is, am I using the proper statistical procedures? Is that giving me the validity that I need? And in the quantitative measurements, um, we have then two types of variables, continuous and discrete. Continuous variables, these are measured on a continuous basis, meaning that there's a scale of some sense in which I measure um, maybe how healthy individuals are, um, but it's not, but I'm not putting them into categories like average, poor, good health, is that I basically list a lot of their ailments and the things that are good with them and <coughs> that my health exists on a continuous basis. In discrete variables, there are, however, a limited number of categories. So for instance, um, 
I just did a online appraisal of my car and I had a few choices, right? Like excellent, good, um, average, or rough condition. So I only had four choices to put my car's condition into. Um, <coughs> and as a result, um, I then have four categories. And, and that's my discreteness then. And you see this, um, you know, if we look at the four different types of measurement that I, <coughs> um, the four different types of measurement that I have, um, nominal, ordinal, interval, and ratio, these all have different categories. Ordinal, interval, and ratio are all ranked. Another word for nominal would be cardinal. But then the difference is that in the interval and the ratio, the distance between the categories measured um, is meaningful. Whereas in ordered, rank ordering something first, second, there is no meaning in the distance between first and second, right? That, you know, in Olympics, right, the, dis the difference between first and second is fractions of a second quite often. But that doesn't matter. You're second place. Um, you're the same as a person who would come in three minutes behind, um, you know, behind the first place person, you would still be second place. And then we have ratio measurements, which do include the additional thing that they have a true zero. <coughs> and you see these um, examples of these measurements. I think this is a quite good way of understanding what these mean. Um, what these different types of measurement means, which would be useful for you if you're doing a, um, uh, a quantitative research project that you're thinking about for, th um, for this class. Now, in the mutually exclusive attributes, when we're talking about quantitative measurements and what it means to engage in principles of good measurement, the mutually exclusive attributes, those are the responses can fit into only one category. So they're mutually exclusive, one or the other. In the exhaustive attributes, um, we should at least have some category for each and every response. And a final principle of good measurement would be unidimensionality. And in unidimensionality, what we have is that every indicator should fit together and indicate a single construct. So that each, con each measurement is working together um, to, to fill that single construct. Now, the difference would be here is whether I'm using, you know, an index or a scale. In an index here, what I'm doing is I'm summing or combining separate measurements to create a single score. So an example of that, if as an economist, would be um, the consumer price index. I'm looking at the prices of lots of different goods, but I'm combining them all into just one single number. And with a scale measurement, what I'm doing is I'm trying to capture the intensity, the direction, and the level of the variable. That's telling me a lot more about what's going on. Indexes are meant so that I can compare different time periods um, and see what's all going on. Now, how do you create an index? Um, essentially, <coughs> I'll give the example here. <laughs> for the uh, consumer price index and in the consumer price index what we're trying to measure are prices and we know that when a person is spending money so that's my purpose when I'm then spending money um, a third of my budget typically goes for housing um, much less goes to how much I spend on toothpaste and other things. So what I do then is I take everything that I buy and I weight it depending on how big of a function of my budget it is. So in Hawaii, I've often thought, or at least since moving here I've thought, that the cost of living in Hawaii, it doesn't truly represent what's all going on here because almost all of it is um, the high cost of living in Hawaii is really just two things, the cost of housing and the cost of energy. But if you look at everything else that's bought in Hawaii, 
I don't know. I mean, I think that the prices are actually rather similar to the mainland. So, <coughs> but the thing is, is that housing is a third of the weight of the price index. So that's why it then appears from my index that the price of living in Hawaii is quite high. And then I need some rates and some standardization. So what I need is a consistent way of looking at things in my price index. So maybe I'll always look at three bedroom homes and how much they cost in a relatively good neighborhood or something like that. I'd have to have some way that I consistently do things um, all the time. Now, if instead I'm constructing a scale, um, you use scales uh, primarily for the idea that um, you know I can that the numbers actually do mean something here. The commonly used scales are the Likert scale, the Thurston scale, um, the Borgatus uh, social distance scale, the semantic differential, and the um, Gutman scaling. The Likert scale you see that it used a lot in um, survey research, uh, the Thurston scale, um, this is the way in which I can, um, in which judges um, sort items into different categories. The Bogardus uh, social distance scale is the way in which I look at the social distance and I measure that social distance, that scale, between different social groups, at least two or more different social groups. In the um, semantic differential here, what I'm doing is I'm creating, marking, measuring the space between adjectives and adverbs. And in the Gutman scaling here, what I'm doing is I'm collecting data to look at whether there is a hierarchical um, pattern between responses. And you see this then here. What you see in these next few slides then are examples of the ways in which you would create a, um, a survey item um, to create these kinds of scales. I like these. Um, you may find these useful as you're thinking about your research project. Um, and the reason why I say that is because even though you don't have to conduct the research, if you're using, if you're creating a survey instrument, you would need to do that kind of thing here. So there's our Likert scale, our Thurston scale, our Bogardus uh, social distance scale, and our semantic differential, and our and finally our Gutman scaling. Okay, so that gives you an idea or a way to think about then the different ways in which we construct the scales, and in general, a way in which you can now further distinguish qualitative from quantitative measurement.